Hello, I'm Elaine Petricelli, and I'm from Book Passage, the bookstore uh, in uh, California, uh, Corte Madera and San Francisco's Ferry Building. And I'm so happy that today we are partnering with our friends and the customers of Tattered Cover and Porter Square Books on this really exciting event with Eric Larson. We've been so lucky today because Ariana Rebelli is going to be in conversation with Eric. And I know that uh, I've never heard any event from Eric Larson that wasn't fascinating and uh, that I really wish could go on for about five hours, but I know this is going to be especially wonderful today. Ariana is the former book editor of BuzzFeed News and her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The Cut, The Guardian, Esquire. I recently saw a Time article of the best books. Um, there are so many things that she writes about that you should follow her because her writing is fascinating. And I'm really glad that uh, I found out about her. So definitely follow Ariana. And Eric Larson is a true friend of independence. I know Book Passage, Tattered Cover, Portage Square, we all feel we are his, he's our own because uh, he has been so good to us over the years. And also his, let's face it, his books fly out of our store. So whether it's The Splendid and the Vile, the most recent uh, hardcover, uh, Dead Wake, in the Garden of the Beasts and uh, Thunderstruck, Devil in the White City, Isaac Storm, which I considered a thriller uh, and a ghost story in a way. Uh, but this time, Isaac has done something really amazing because he has given us a novel and it is thrilling to say the least. You won't sleep if you start it tonight, but that's okay. You don't want to sleep anyway. And you can start No One Goes Alone. I should. I hope that you will buy it from Book Passage, Tattered Cover, or Porter Square. But each of the stores is going to be doing a drawing. Thanks to our good friends at Libro FM, the audiobook company that works with independent bookstores and supports independence by giving a portion of every sale that comes from their customers back to the bookstore. So please do order, but also if you have registered or registered for the drawing, one of you will get a three month subscription free for Libro FM. And I need to tell you that uh, that is going to be kind of the way the drug dealer on the corner works because I got a three month subscription to Libro FM once and I have never stopped. I love it. So uh, I can't wait to hear more about this novel um, with William James, the philosopher, about finding, a, going to the Isle of Dorne to find people who have been mysteriously going a, just going missing. Uh, it's 1905. So sit back and get ready to be enchanted, a little scared, and learn a lot about what went on. And so I'm going to turn this back now to Ariana. Thank you so much. Mm. That was the loveliest introduction I've ever had. <laughs> thank you. And <laughs> thank you, Eric. Nice to meet you. Nice. Uh, likewise, yes. Um, I'm so excited to be talking about this. I uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I started listening to it. Thanks you to Libro FM because they do advanced copies. And it's funny that um, Elaine mentioned not being able to sleep because I'm realizing now that I did have, I don't want to say a nightmare, but I had a ghost dream, which I don't usually. So oh, good, it was seeping good. into That's my great. brain. That's um, a good endorsement. I like that. I yeah, like that. It, it definitely got, it got in my brain. Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, yeah. You mentioned um, 
in the in a note that you have had this story in mind for a long time. You started working on it while you were on tour for Thunderstruck, right? Could you tell a little bit about the genesis? Right. Yeah, and that was, you know, Thunderstruck goes way back. I think that was like 2006, something like that. And it's like, I, I mean, this is not like a Sistine Chapel thing where, you know, for, for the, all those years I was working on this thing, you know, it's just not, it, it's not that kind of thing. It began when I was on, on a book tour and, and I was frankly bored. I mean, between stops at wonderful places like Book Passage, of course. Um, but I was bored in the, in the spaces in between, bored and terrified on my flights. I needed to do something to occupy myself. I'm, I'm a lousy flyer. Terrible, terrible. So I just, I just, a couple of other things sort of came to play on this. And one was that I love a good ghost story. The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson is probably my favorite of, of, of the lot. Um, and, you know, I basically had sort of run out of the ghost stories of the kind that I really like. I mean, I, I don't like, well, there are some gruesome elements in mine, I guess, but I don't like gruesome ghost stories, you know, like, like the movie Hereditary is terrifying, but it's just, just a little <laughs> bit too much. Anybody who's seen that film, you know exactly what I mean. So, so I just thought I want to write a ghost story of the kind that I would actually like to read. Plus, in the course of my research for Thunderstruck, I come across all this real life, true nonfiction material about the 19th century, late 19th century obsession with ghosts and the afterlife. I could only fit some of that into my book, Thunderstruck, where, where of course, where it, where it was relevant. But I had all this other stuff. And so I don't even know what the genesis was of the of the actual of the plot with with William James, the pioneering Harvard psychologist, being um, one of the lead protagonists in the book. But suddenly it just sort of started to unfold. Um, and over time, over over all these years, it's sort of a hobby. I would I would revisit the ghost story give it to one or more of my daughters and see what they thought. They pronounced it pretty scary, you know, but it's a lot better than since the, the last daughter actually read it. Um, and then um, what happened was, so stop me if I'm blathering too much, but you know, what happened was that the publishing industry evolved to a point where it created what I feel to be the ideal vehicle for this story, for me at least, as the teller of this this, I don't narrate it, but as, as the person who wrote this, this, this story, an audio original is ideal because A, I, I really do believe that ghost stories are best told aloud. B, I was always concerned if I tried to do anything with, with this, this, this book, this novella, um, that, that I would blur my, my, I don't know, for lack of a better word, brand. You know, I write nonfiction, not fiction. And suddenly here's this guy writing fiction. Wait, wait, well, well what's going on? And somehow doing an audio original felt to me like, like I was preserving that distinction, that Chinese, Chinese wall between, between the, 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 the two worlds. And um, so that's how, that's how this thing came about. When you were writing it, when you decided that the audio original was the way to go, did that change the way um, you wrote your process, knowing this would be something people hear rather than, you know, read? Not at all. Not at all. Because, because the evolution of this thing was that my, my, my first thought, uh, again, concerned about, you know, not confusing readers and so forth, was that, was that I was going to simply um, launch this on my website. Um, just as a sort of a freebie, as a gift to my, my my fans. In fact, I redesigned my website in order to to make a sort of a serialization of this novella um, a, 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 a possible kind of thing. Um, I never I never got around to that. Um, uh, you know, I, I I I I do procrastinate quite a bit, as people in my family will, of course, uh, uh, assure you if you call them. Um, and so, so it was at that point that audio originals sort of came to, to fruition. And I thought, wow, that'd be kind of an interesting thing. So there we are. Nice. And something that I thought was interesting that you mentioned earlier too, was that, you know, the type of nonfiction you write often gets, you know, people sometimes think it's a novel. It, it reads as fiction often because of the narrative, um, features of it. And I'm curious if, uh, if you felt much of a difference writing fiction, if it was a different process or if you were even like nervous, I mean, you're 
certainly, you know, you're not a, <laughs> you're a pro. It was well, happy, it feel happily, different. Yes, well, <laughs> that's a very perceptive question. Happily, as I was writing this, I was not actually thinking about publishing it, so I did not feel nervous. You know, this was like this <laughs> yeah. was like something that I was just basically doing for myself. You know, some, something that was that was really fun. But, you know, um, in, in terms of writing nonfiction versus fiction. With my nonfiction, I try to, the way I look at it, the way I like to, to explain this to people is that, you know, I use the tactics and techniques of fiction to tell nonfiction stories. All my stories are true. Everything's real. Everything between quotes is actually a, from a real document, whatever. Um, but I use um, the tactics of a fiction writer to tell the story. Um, you, know, with, you know, cliffhangers, cutaways, and, and so forth. With this, the, the distinction was, um, obviously, this is a, this is a made-up story. I, I'm, I'm telling a story. And frankly, one thing this did was gave me huge respect for novelists, people who, who do fiction, you know, full-time. Because honestly, I think it's a lot tougher. It's a lot tougher because with nonfiction, the story's there. You just have to find it. And you even know how the story ends. I mean, how nice is that, right? You just have to find enough detail to tell the story in a very rich and, and, and compelling mm -hmm. way. With fiction, you got to make everything up, and and it's like wow, that's kind of hard. Oh, but one deli <laughs> one delight with uh, with uh, fiction though for me is that yeah, you know, like I say with my nonfiction books, you know, everything between quotation marks is is from a real document or 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 you know, t you know trial transcripts or, or you know, newspaper interviews or whatever. Um, doing dialogue with uh, in in a work of fiction was like. Oh God! Do I at last get to make something up? <laughs> so, <laughs> and and so it was like, no, it really is. It's so so much fun to sort of experiment with with dialogue and see see what I can do with it. You know, I, I did take a course once um, in in writing uh, writing fiction with a great teacher, Richard Bausch, fa fabulous author, fabulous teacher, one of the funniest human beings I've ever met. And one of the things that that stuck in my mind from that class was his tactic. A technique he, 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 he teaches his students. So this, is, this goes back 20 or 30 years. I took this, this seminar with him at Towson State University outside Baltimore. Um, one of the things he, he talked about was something called the veer. It's the veer in dialogue. And something that a lot of, a lot of neophyte writers, like, like I was, um, don't, um, don't get. And that is the dialogue. You can't make dialogue too functional. You know, it, it's not like, like a, like doing a um, uh, you know a drill in French one like you know who you Paul oh je vais à la bibliothèque you know it's not like that back and forth like how are you Jack oh I am fine how are you it's the the, the the way real people talk is a lot more complex like you know depending on what's going on with the story I say good evening Ariana what's how was your day today and your response is you son of a bitch. No, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't address exactly what I said. You go into whatever the thing is that's, that's, that's powering the background behind the conversation. So anyway, it was a real delight to, to play with, uh, to play with dialogue and to actually get to do it, you know, just to get it out of my system, you know, yeah. so that was fun. Yeah. It feels like a, a different muscle to exercise, I'm sure. Uh, totally. um, but of course, I mean, this is really based in, it's deeply rooted in history. There's a lot that's historically yes. accurate and you research. Yes. Um, and I would love to give, you know, people watching a sense of that story yeah. of that time period and what drew you to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so without giving too much, I, I don't want to tell too much about the, the, the plot of the story, but, but you know, like I said, I mean, one of the things I really wanted to try to do was somehow, somehow animate all this great stuff that I had discovered in the course of my researching my book, Thunderstruck. You know, for example, um, the fact that there was this Society for Psychical Research which was a big deal. You know, lots of the most famous physicists were members. Um, uh, Mark Twain was a member. Uh, uh, I mean, just about anybody who was a, sort of a celebrity in the arts was a member of the Society for Psychical Research. And again, that's psychical, P-S-Y-C-H-I-C-A-L, not psychological. Um, and and th this society was devoted to the scientific exploration of basically the possibility that there was an afterlife, the possibility of, of, of ghosts. This society, deadly serious society, um, had, a, had a committee on haunted houses. And it was this committee 
that was the sponsor of, of the expedition to, to the Isle of Dorn, um, which is the, the, the setting in my book for these, these unfortunate, um, increasingly dark events that, that, that unfold. But um, in, in, in order to, you know, my earliest conception was, and this is also what sort of helped me get out of the gate in terms of just being fiction, was to think of it as, as, a, as a, a ghost story with footnotes. And, and that's sort of how I proceeded that, that you know, maybe I was actually going to have source notes geared to the, the pages and so forth. And you know, I proceeded along those lines. And, and, and then this, this, it, the, the concept of this being an audio original came up. And, and I think, okay, yeah, this ghost story footnotes, audio original. And then my, my youngest daughter who directs podcasts was like, dad, footnotes aren't going to work in a, in a, in a narrated, <laughs> narrated audio book. And I was like, oh. That's a very good point. <laughs> so, so the way the, the way the the audiobook is configured now is that this is a, a wonderful narrator does it. He's perfect. He's perfect. Um, but I narrate the uh, source essay at the end, where I just talk about the things that were actually real events, the people who who informed the characters. I mean, William James was a real character, and his ailments, his his tragic story of his son. <laughs> Um, uh, his death and his effort to communicate with his son through a medium, his his explorations of spirituality are all the real deal. These things were really a part of part of his life, and now they're they're part of part of my story as part of his his backstory. His thinking about this informs the the, the, the saga as as it goes. So so. You know, th those are the underpinnings, but no footnotes, thankfully. <laughs> it's a good way to use that um, that final like author's note with all of the to have all this information because it is. I think you make a joke about it, it would put them to sleep if it were just you know footnotes listed, but the yes, essay yeah, works. <laughs> I, 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 I think so. Although although you know, I, I have to say that my my nonfiction fans are rabid footnote lovers. You know. Oh yeah, that and, makes sense. Yeah, I love a I love a good footnote, um, frankly, and and I like to I like to salt my footnotes in my nonfiction books with, you know, as many you know bizarre you know true stories of things that I that I can you know things that I can't fit into the main narrative, but it's like oh my god, that's going in because I I can't believe that you know this this thing happened during world war ii or whatever so uh -huh. so i'm a big fan of footnotes but uh, you know uh, you know I, I i bowed out in this case <laughs> something i loved about this because i'm also a big ghost story fan um i am a big horror fan and i like that this is a ghost story but it's also about ghost stories and so you have a lot of really um interesting dialogues about the value of belief in the supernatural and humanity and what it gives people and there's this tension between the people who are you know kind of make room for that possibility that maybe there is something and those who just you know can't entertain the possibility right. Right, and i'm right, wondering right. where you fall in that scope and if <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know okay. and and yes. just your approach to the question I, I think you know where, where i fall in it, like if you're, if you're basically asking me do i believe in ghosts is that basically what you're asking me yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to yeah. put you on record and say you have to say, <clears throat> but <laughs> <clears throat> no, but yeah. You know, so, so I have to say, I put myself probably in the category of 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 William James, the the real um, William James from the past. That he was at one point, by the way, the president of the Society for Psychical Research. Um, I put myself in his his position, where you know he's 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 open to the possibility, but it hasn't been proven to him yet. You know, and so, and but also part of me is like, I kind of like to believe in the possibility, even though the rational me is like, you know, seriously, Eric. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, there's just enough weird things that happen in my life that, that, you know, who knows? I'm not going to say <laughs> I don't. <clears throat> um, sorry, I'm Zoom stuff, of course. Um, <laughs> wouldn't be in Zoom event. I should, I, should, I should say that my, my absolute favorite ghost story is um, is The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Love that book. I, I think I've read it four times. You know, it's just a really, it, that's the kind of ghost story that I, that I really like, especially the scene where, I don't know if you've read it, but there's the scene where the two women are 
in, in one of the bedrooms and, and one is scared and reaches out her hand and thinks she's holding the hand of her roommate, but she's not. Huh. <laughs> There's no one there. <laughs> it's, I mean, it really reads as that kind of a classic, um, classic, good, scary ghost story. And you oh, can well, tell, thanks. yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, I just think it, it's very clear that you are a fan of the, the, um, the format. And I just, I'm, I was curious about, um, you know, with these conversations about these people who are open to the possibility of, you know, waiting for a sign from the beyond um, and the role of people, <clears throat> what, what something talking to the past gives them, sorry, I'm like tripping over right. this word, but right. the relationship with the past. Um, yeah. And I'm curious, you know, if that's something that, that has drawn you towards the stories you tell, you know, what do you think is, do you feel like you are in communication with the past? Does it feel like a sort of beyond for you as, as a historian? No. <laughs> no. Fair. That's fair. <laughs> Such um, a hard question. Such an easy answer. No, no. That's totally fair. But, but what I really what I really loved exploring um, was I, I, I like kind of playing with some of the tropes of the ghost story. For example, here's this this house on the Isle of Dorne, the Isle of Dorne being a, a total invention by, by the way. Here's this house on the Isle of Dorne and rather than, uh, maybe I'm giving away too much of it, rather than it be the conventional haunted house where it's scary from the get-go, this is a house that all those who are now ensconced on this expedition sponsored by Society for Psychical Research, this is a house that is actually incredibly welcoming and pleasant you know the various guests report never being as productive or never sleeping as well as in this 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 house and then all sorts of awful things begin to gradually gradually happen and dispel that notion in, in, a, in a heartbeat but along the way i wanted to explore um some historical some historical um 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 uh, 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 historical characters in the context of, of how people actually behaved back in the day and then and turn those things a little bit on their end like there's a sort of a sort of a, a, a tension between two characters romantic tension where um, one of the women Catherine Holbrook um, you know she's she's here on this island everybody feels much freer to be something other than what society victorian society called upon them to be and so so it was a lot of fun playing with that tension especially with my lead uh, my lead character just josiah frost young man who works for the british post office you know sounds boring he was not like a guy who you know, stuck stuck mail into a into a box not that nothing that's a a, a, a boring thing, but he was he was a pioneer himself in the field of wireless, which is sort of an element in the in this in this ghost story. And and poor Josiah is is still caught up in the Victorian way of doing things, and he deals with um, Catherine, who is not caught up any longer for whatever reasons, because of her background and also who she, who she is. And <laughs> He is the prototype of me when I was a single guy, you know, you know, flailing in the world of dating. <laughs> so, so anybody who hears this, that you know, that that's that's the author. Anyway, but it was really fun, and I especially liked also playing like one of the characters, Nathaniel Holm. Now he's an invention, but he is the invented son of a, of a famous medium named D. D. Holm, Daniel Douglas Holm, Douglas D. U. N. G. L. A. S. S. Um, and poor, poor Nathaniel is just, he doesn't have it. You know, he thinks he's got it. He thinks he's got the spiritual thing. He thinks he's got the, the medium qualities, but yeah, you know, it just apparently was not passed down. But at least, at least until uh, uh, something happens later in the, in the novella. So just playing with all these things was really a lot of fun. And there's one, another woman, very, very compelling to me, Madeline Nash, also very compelling to, to Josiah, who was a little confused at first about who he should be hitting on, if you don't mind <laughs> using that term. But Madeline, Madeline Nash was this sort of um, pioneering um, uh, uh, pathologist with the home office. Um, who was not not in real life? She's an invention, also, but she's a pioneering pathologist based on a, a real pathologist that I had done some work on, actually in the course of uh, in the course of Thunderstruck, also. 
Um, so she's a pioneering pathologist who in the in the British press, she's so cool at what she does. She's 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 known throughout Britain as the ice mum. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that, that's that's that that's her thing. So it's really so much fun to play with these things and basically animate history, animate historical types, um, and make them hopefully come come alive. Yeah. Is is there um anything like any other period that you focus on? for your nonfiction that you feel drawn to that you would want to visit in fiction you know this part of it came from the research you were doing for Thunderstruck but I'm curious right. if there are any other uh, time periods that you would want to bring to life in fiction well you know I, I, as to whether I want to bring another historical period to life I, I don't know I'm, I'm not a I'm not a huge fan I have to confess of, of historical mm -hmm. historical fiction maybe I wrote it but I'm not necessarily a <laughs> historical fiction but you know, if I were to 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 do something, um, uh, uh, probably the the realm that would most intrigue me would be most compelling is the area I, I looked at <clears throat> when I was doing my book in the Garden of Beasts, which was a look at at um, uh, the rise of Hitler in 1933-34 through the eye, eyes of America's first ambassador to Nazi Germany, you know, William Dodd, and through to his his daughter, who at first was really caught up in, in, in the whole Nazi thing, you know, bizarrely. That period is so full of just interesting issues, darkness, why people didn't pay attention. On the other hand, it's also really well-trodden ground. And so, you know, I, I'd have to have some some idea for a work of fiction that would at least advance the ball in some direction. And there's just so much stuff has been done. But, you know, maybe I'll just wait for the next book tour and then see what happens, you know? Yeah, see inspiration what, will strike. <laughs> see what subject comes up, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you, how did you decide which characters you were going to adapt um, versus bringing into the story just this full invention? Boy, you know, that is a, um, that's a lot easier to answer when, if you ask me that about my nonfiction books. The, one, of the, one of the things that, that, that I loved about doing this work of fiction is that I really can't explain where many of the elements came from. Like recently, um, uh, I was asked uh, in an interview, well, the Isle of Dorne, well, where did the name Dorne come from? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I mean, I, honestly, I, no, truly, honestly, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it was it, the lovely thing was the characters just sort of came knocking at my door. You know, I mean, I knew William James had to be in this story because, boy, he is one of two characters in the all of things that I've I've done that I just I just I just am absolutely in awe. The other, by the way, being Frederick Law Olmsted, who was, of course, the the designer of Central Park, but also the landscape guy behind the, the World's Fair of 1893. Just a, just a genius. Um, um, so, so William James, um, uh, you know, the, the, the pioneer uh, psychologist, um, uh, uh, his, his writing is just brilliant. Um, you could just, you know, sink into his, his analysis of of, of, of states of being and, and, and so forth. So I knew he had, he had to be in the story, plus the fact that he was the president of the Society for Psychical Research, plus the fact that he was, he was actually quite seriously ill when he, you know, he made this venture out to uh, the Isle of Dorne, and he was, in fact, seriously ill. Mm -hmm. um, and also elements of his, his own past just felt like, wow, this has to, be, has to be there. But of course, there had to be a flirtation for him as well. So there's Beatrice Northrup, who, who works for a very famous British magazine, and she has been with the acceptance of all the other members of this team. She is now, now there to sort of chronicle the story of this expedition to Dorne, and, and she and James obviously have this little thing going on between them, which I, I, I quite like. But um, the characters just kind of kind of stepped out behind a curtain on their own, really. I mean, it, it, it sounds strange to say that, but they really did. I mean, how did Catherine Holbrook get into this thing and her past? And how did Madeline Nash get into this? I don't know, but I'm glad they did. Yeah, no, me too. It's fascinating to, because that is kind of how it works. You know, it's like they tell you about themselves in fiction. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Um, something that is so present in this is the storytelling. And obviously this is an audio original, so that's another layer of of listening to stories, of hearing, of um, of oral communication. And the guests, again, I, mean, I don't want to give away too much, but they have a lot of um, they have a lot of evenings of, of sharing information with each yes. other presenting. And so I'm curious if, uh, if storytelling in that format of oral, you know, storytelling has been a big part of your life, formative part. Um, you know, I, I'm curious, I know you mentioned that your daughters listen to. Well, your- it was, <laughs> it was a big part of my, it's a big part of my life with my, when my daughters were young. I mean, yeah, you know, first, first we of course read them books, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, like, Good Night Moon is, you know, of course, a favorite and so forth. But then I, I morphed into telling them scary stories. Um, and I, I always very careful, though, to, to have the, the story end on a happy note, because you don't want to have a kid go to bed with a with a potentially scary ending hanging in, in, in her mind. I've got three daughters. Um, and so so I would tell these I would tell these stories each night. Um, and, and in some cases, it'd be a, a serial story, uh, you know, one by one to each daughter. Each daughter got the story by, by herself. Um, and I remember that at one point, uh, I'm not sure which was my middle daughter. I don't know how old she was, but I think it was, it was her class. Or maybe it was my youngest kid's class. Anyway, I, I was at some kind of school function. And I don't know what inspired this, but, you know, basically I found myself sitting outside the back door of this gym where there was this whole, this whole big parent night thing going on with like 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 10 little kids s- sitting in a circle around me as I was telling them a ghost story that I was making up on the spot <laughs> and, and, and as I recall it two left in tears <laughs> <laughs> and so and so I thought okay Eric you've got something there uh, number two pull back pull it up yeah. and this happily maybe not here but <laughs> Go home and do not pass back through the gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I have a toddler who is just starting to figure out what scary is, and you know, seeing what in the stories sparks him as this is a scary thing. It's, it's an interesting thing to watch. Um, yeah, but I yeah. mean, I, I think you're right that hearing um, a scary story is a, a special kind of experience. I mean, personally, I feel like having the audiobook it's really just in your head. You're visualizing it in such a really yes. immediate way. Um, yes. And the narrator, like you mentioned, is just and so the best perfect. thing about, The best thing about an audio ghost story is that you can literally read it in the dark. Yes, that's you true. Yeah. You, if, yeah. if you're man enough or woman enough, you can sit there <laughs> in the dark and listen to this and see what happens. Yeah. So are you a fan of any of the, you know, ghost hunting there's that's a big part of our culture right now the ghost hunting shows the ouija board like that level of... yeah i'm not i <laughs> no. I, I, I truly am not i mean it's it, yeah, a lot of that but it seems to be just just for show you know and i and and you know it's not like i say i mean i'm open to the possibility but i'm more more from a william james sort of sort of perspective um uh, yeah. but you know I, you, uh, more power to them you know yeah yeah, I mean, people and enjoy. Look, if, you, if you find one, let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's where I stand. It's like I would, I would love to know. I yeah, have one to. Of, yeah. One of the, one of the things that you you, you touched on that, that I particularly liked about this 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 expedition was that was that it was structured uh, because of William James. This was his his choice. Um, that each of the principal uh, each of the principles in this thing has a story. Um, that that. It, it involves why they were selected in the first place. And so each night is allocated to one person to sort of talk about why and how they came to be in this, in this story. Um, and um, I particularly like that, that, that setup, especially as a, as a frame for bad things then actually beginning to happen concurrently with their nightly accounts of what was going on in their lives. So that was a lot of fun. And I think, you know, it, it's worth mentioning, because I know you, I saw and you, you tweeted recently, like, it is very scary. So so uh, do you but, warn people who are not, you know, maybe fans who are not that into horror, what do you think is the level of scariness here for? Oh, super scary. 
Yeah. Super scary. I think it's, I think it's potentially if you, if you read it in the right context, I think it's really scary, you know? Yeah. And, and I hope people have terrible nightmares. <laughs> I think it's, I think it can happen. Um, we're getting some really great questions. And so I'm going to go ahead and jump over to that. But if you have more comment um, in the YouTube chat and add them. Um, so someone uh, wants to know, uh, what was the difference for you in research between fiction and nonfiction? Oh, very good question. Um, basically, um, the difference was 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 huge um, in the sense that I do a lot of uh, immersive research for my nonfiction books. For this one, I, I did I did almost none because I had it all. You know, I, I had everything I wanted, and 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 I was in, inventing the 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 venue, the source, you know, the place where this thing was going to happen. So. So really minimal, minimal research other than what I already knew and had. Of course, I reread a lot of William James's material. I, I, I delved again into the into the history of Daniel Douglas home and into the into um, the, 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 the history of some of some of the other mediums who are referenced in the story. Like like there was a character, uh, not character, there was a a real life medium named um, Lenore Piper. Mrs. Piper is how she was known sort of universally around the world. And, and William James studied her, um, had multiple seances with her. He, he, he could not figure out whether she was the real deal or not. And he actually went to his death unsure, well, convinced actually that she was in fact the real deal. And he, he makes a remark um, in, in my my novella that he actually made in, in one of his one of his um, his really erudite um, papers on the subject of spirituality is that if you if you uh, I'm going to blow this quote but if you if you if you seek to prove that not all crows are black you need only prove that one crow is white. And in the terms of mediums and so forth, Lenore Piper was his white crow. She was the one that challenged, you know, his otherwise rational appraisal of mediums and so forth. And so I found that very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great, um, that was a great question. I think you did get it right. I was, because I wrote it down. Um, Good. So, <laughs> um, Katie is wondering, I always love the specific historical details you include in your books. What was your favorite tidbit that you included in this story? I don't know if that overlaps with what you're just talking about or if you yeah, have another yeah, one. Yeah. Well, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I love, I love, I love, in fact, live for, for salting my books with little, little anomalous details that, that hopefully still fit the narrative, but that, that help, help ignite the imagination in, in readers. And one of the things that I guess in, in, in this, one of the elements that I think is, is, is I, I loved from my research for Thunderstruck and that I have, I have worked into this, this story is my lead character, Josiah Frost's uh, interest, his professional interest in wireless, which at the time with the, when wireless um, was first, when it was first coming into being, invented, invented, well, People are going to argue with this. There's, there's a healthy, robust debate about who actually invented wireless, but basically Marconi typically gets the credit. But when wireless was first coming to the fore, it was, I mean, you can imagine, it was deeply mysterious. I mean, how on earth was this happening that messages could be transferred from one place to another completely invisible? You know, you have to, you have to put yourself back in that time and just think, how is that possible? And of course, there were a lot of skeptics who didn't believe it could happen. But a lot of people, as wireless uh, became, you know, definitely proven to be a fact, came to wonder if, in fact, that was a way to communicate with the dead. Maybe this was a vehicle for that kind of communication. And that's why Josiah Frost has brought his wireless apparatus just as a just as a means of seeing if there was any sort of interruption in the in the in the in the electromagnetic diaspora in this in this house, that was sort of his his element of the investigation. So I really like that that part. I mean, the whole wireless thing. Yeah, it is a fascinating little side story, and and it was um, a great function of continuing the conversation of 
allowing for possibility, you know, because I think you have a character who says, years ago, would you believe that this was possible? So why can you not entertain, you know, the possibility of a ghost, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. and he and he doesn't really believe it. He's just he's just he's he's he, as he says he, he has really brought this along to see if there, in fact, there would be some distortion in the electromagnetic plane that mm -hmm. would be picked up by his by his wireless, and then of course some bizarre things start to happen with him. So yeah, right. Um, Heather Young is wondering: Was there any research you came up for that came up for um, No One Goes Alone that may lead to another book? <laughs> no. <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> Easy answer. Okay. No, actually, excellent question. But you know, I, I I can truly say that no, there there was no no spin-off thing that occurred to me. Um, th this uh, the these these various characters introduced themselves, um, came out from behind the curtain, and there were no more characters waiting there. So yeah. That's good. It's, you know, you get a sense of completion for as a writer, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Now it's not to say I'm not going to write another novel. It's not, not that's not what I'm saying at all, but <clears throat> but this is this is the thing it's itself. So. Uh did you find there was freedom in writing fiction versus your work in nonfiction? And we touched a little bit about this, but I'm curious. Yeah, there, 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 there was definitely freedom. <clears throat> but as I as I said, well, it's freedom. Um, in fact, fiction is hard. I, fiction is a lot harder than nonfiction. You, know, you have this, there's this interesting paradox. Excuse me, I have to take a sip of water. There's a very interesting paradox with nonfiction because it happened. You know, no matter how bizarre the event, as you write the, 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 the story, people have to go with it. You have to believe it because that's what really happened, right? But the paradox is that with fiction, if you write something that's too unbelievable, you know, you'll lose your audience. You know, that's that that's that's the paradox. So fiction is actually quite hard. You have to you have to somehow persuade your audience with layers of layers of detail um, uh, without going too far too early into something that will make them think, oh, forget it. That, yeah, no. So, so it's it's hard. I, I it, it it was liberating, but it was also hard. When um mm -hmm. when in the process of writing it, did you figure out that this wouldn't just be for you or just for a small audience? That it was possibly going to get. Well, you know, I, I, would, I would say after the after after tinkering with the thing for for about a year, and again off off and on, you know, adding things. And, in my early morning while I was working on a nonfiction book. I like to write in the early morning and I wanted something to write. So I wrote in the early morning. Um, you know, as I got to the point where, um, you know, I, I, I ended it, you know, I got to the point where I, I had, I finished the story. I knew how I wanted it to end. And as Hemingway said, um, uh, you know, you, 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 the most important thing about writing a novel is to finish it. <laughs> and so and it's true, you know, and I got I, I got to the end and I thought, OK, I've got this thing. I've got this website. And that's when I started thinking, maybe I should just just maybe I'll just give this away to my my fans, you know, roll it out in Dickensian fashion as a series, you know, maybe over maybe over 10 weeks leading up to Halloween or something like that. And that idea rattled around in my brain for, you know, another decade or so or whatever until <laughs> last year, I hope I'm not telling tales out of school, till last year during a marketing meeting from two years ago, this is pandemic time, so really two years ago, <laughs> mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know what I mean, right? So two yeah. years ago, I was uh, at a, in a marketing meeting before the launch of my book about Churchill, The Splendid and the Vile, we were just talking about things. And I said, oh, and by the way, something that can figure into your planning is I, I may try to to launch this thing on my on my website um, for Halloween, for the upcoming Halloween, um, just just so just so you know. And, and I said it was just just sort of a, a thing I'm just going to give away to my my fans. And I think everybody around the table was like, "Good, good, 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 give away." <laughs> And so, <laughs> yeah, and so, and so, another little book. <laughs> yeah, and so, so, so again, you know, one thing led to another, and and here was the advent of, uh, you know, here's the, the idea of audio originals had just had just begun to sort of come to the fore, and it's like, that's it. That was like like a eureka moment. That's what's gonna. That's what it's gonna be. Yeah, yeah, it's great. 
Um, someone was wondering, do you think this time period is inherently better suited to ghost stories as opposed to a modern setting? So this time period being, you know, the early 20th century. This one. Yeah, I, I think this is a great time for ghost stories. You know, I mean, everybody's sort of locked in anyway, or, well, coming, emerging now. But, but, pardon me, motorcycle outside. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> or sorry, else is the ghost. Anyway, no, I think, I think actually this is a good time because it, I, I think this is a time when, well, first of all, it, 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 it's a time when there is this, this diaphanous cloud of, of sorrow and grief. Um, and just like after World War I, there was this, this huge groundswell of interest in trying to reach the dead because Britain had lost so many young people. And, and that, that sort of gave, gave impetus to the Society for Cyclical Research, certainly to one of its key members, Oliver Lodge, who was a very famous physicist in, that, in, that, in the society and in that era, who himself lost his son Raymond um, during World War I and spent literally the rest of his own life trying to to communicate with Raymond in in the afterlife and and ultimately becoming convinced that he had communicated in fact he wrote an entire book called Raymond about that that very thing so anyway so I, so I think that I think that um, fortunately or unfortunately I think this is a good time for 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 ghost stories because you can just sort of you sort of feel that that maybe there's something else out there I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm no, blathering. Makes, no, you're not. No, <laughs> this is what we're here for. We're here to hear your thoughts. Um, I mean, I think you're right. This is a very, uh, it's, it's an isolated time. Um, but I also think there's something uh, eerie that, you know, about the time period of the, you know, early 1900s that people just assume, especially with, because it's this advent of, of just curiosity about the spiritualism and everything. It lends yeah, itself well. Yeah, and, and, and actually, one of the things that I talk about in, in the book, and I came across in Thunderstruck also, <clears throat> is that is that um, uh, the, the the person who really was at fault for for starting everybody <clears throat> wandering off looking for ghosts was Darwin. Darwin's mm -hmm. writing um, this this idea that there was a mechanistic um, origin to to man, you know, challenged our, everybody's belief in God. So so. A, a lot of people went off more and more ardently believing in God. A lot of others, uh, you know, powered by these, these Darwinian revelations, <clears throat> went off looking for proof that there was more to it than, than this mechanistic uh, evolutionary thing. And so I, I always found that that fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that was a great thing um, that I actually stopped and rewound because I I had never heard that um, specifically cited to Darwin, the, you know, the mechanist versus yeah. the yeah. believers. And it makes sense, you know, if he like presented yeah. this new way of believing in the world. And well, and, and another aspect of the time that sort of was conducive to, <clears throat> to thinking about ghosts and, and, you know, these people um, on my, my little island of, of Dorne, they were into ghost stories. Also these, these nightly things were actually ghost stories. This is this sort of everybody's cozy around the fire with great wine as each person sort of, sort of un unfolds their stories. And one thing, you know, I talk about, you know, uh, the pandemic and so forth and times of times of unrest and whatever have tended to be times for stories like this. One of the things that really governed that, that period was the death of Victoria. Um, that was a huge event um, in the history of, of, of Britain. I mean, she was the, the queen, you know, she was the mother of all these, you know, you know of, of, of the empire. And, and people really felt lost when she died. So that's part of the context as well, the story. Yeah, there are a lot of layers of grief in the story and that's certainly one of them, which is, you know, makes people yearn for something, you know. Right, something, that's it, yearn for something. Something. <laughs> um, Leslie is wondering, did it take you the same amount of time to write this book compared to your others? Well, <laughs> it's very, it's very hard to say exactly how long this book caught, uh, took, took, because remember, you know, it started back in 2006, you know, you do the math, I and mean, that was a long time ago, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my books do not typically take, take, what does that work out to, you know, 
nearly 20 years. No, I mean, it, 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 this was an anomaly. Um, my nonfiction books tend to take three or four years from conception to, to publication. Um, um, and, and, you know, if I had simply devoted myself, if, if I was a professional fiction writer, this would have taken, I don't know, uh, I don't know, three, six months, something like that, but mm -hmm. it took a lot longer. How do you land, I mean, this is just me being curious, how do you land on your conception for the, the your nonfiction? You know, what has drawn you to when you're like, this is it, this is going to be the next the story, you know? Uh, oh man, you got another hour? I mean, <laughs> this is the, no, seriously, this is the toughest, toughest part of my- I'm sure. Part of my thing, and 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 you know, I I actually got kind of lucky with the with the pandemic lockdown because, you know, um, being locked down, and actually, you know, as you know, I mean, lockdown is what a writer does. You know, it's like okay, what's what's different? You know, you know what I mean. <laughs> and so so, but this was it was an ideal time to to start thinking about what my next idea was because you know my, my book Splendid and Vile was done and and you know. I, my, my tour got literally cut in half by the pandemic, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that led me to start thinking about what the next thing is. And, and for me, it's a process of, I wish I, I wish I knew where these ideas came from. You know, I just sort of put myself in the way of, of ideas, do a lot of reading of, 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 of things, you know, that I would never ordinarily have read. You know, one thing, one thing I did during during the pandemic was there's this this is great website called JSTOR. I don't know if you know it, but JSTOR has has journal articles from like a, a zillion academic publications, historical journals, and so forth. And so, you know, I was really high and dry, and I just started playing around. And I would I would type into the search engine in this website the mystery of and, <laughs> and see and see what came up. Uh -huh. And, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can dig up when you say the mystery of. None of it was any, any good for a book, you know, but it sure helped me feel like I was using my time productively, at least some way. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, it's really a story of, of putting myself in the way of, of luck, if you will, of, of, of reaching out into this, you know, it's sort of like, I guess, sifting for gold in a fast moving stream. There's all this other stuff flying past and suddenly there's something in my, in my little, my little net and it's a gold nugget. And mm -hmm. maybe that's my next idea. So. Yeah. I love that. I guess we're getting um, the book. <laughs> Let me see. Um, do we have time for a few more questions or do we want to, okay, great. We have a couple, um, I just lost track of, uh, one that I really liked. Um, oh, okay. So uh, as an early writer, um, oh, Dave McCullough as an early writer always kept his ideas about book topics secret until he started getting input from lecture attendees at early book tours. Did you often get ideas? Who, 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 are, we, who are we talking about? This is, uh, McCullough. Oh, McCullough. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's the god of narrative history, yes. Okay, <laughs> um, oh, as an sorry. early writer. Repeat uh, that question. Sure, sure. Uh, David McCulloch, as an early writer, always kept his ideas about book topics secret until he started getting input from lecture attendees at early book tours. Did you often get ideas that way? Never. Okay. Never. <laughs> there you but go. I, but, I, but, but I do. I do keep my ideas very secret for the for the first for the first couple of years of of, of a project. I keep them as secretly as I, as I can because, you know, it's, it's a very sensitive time. I'm, I'm thin skinned. I'm actually, I'm relatively fragile, honestly. And, you know, if I was to tell you now what my next idea was and your face just fell flat, <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> I'd be yeah like, there's a risk in that. Oh yeah. There's a, there's a serious risk. Yeah. So. And then finally, uh, this might be the haunting of Phil House, but um, what is the scariest book you've ever read, and would you read it again? Oh, okay, good, good, okay. Well, first of all, of course I would, but but I'm trying to think which is the scariest book I've ever read. Haunting of Hill House is very scary. Um, I love it as a ghost story. I love it for what it is. Um, 
I think scarier was um, the the novel Rosemary's Baby, which was oh. very good, very good, and also the, the films really good. The film is really good. What the, the best thing about that film, I'm, I'm diverging, is when the camera as as the film opens, the camera, you know, I, I don't know if you recall this, but the camera comes in from way up onto a, a, a building that is clearly the Dakota here in Manhattan. And the camera just sort of comes closer and closer and closer with this very sweet, not scary music. And therefore, because it's so sweet and not scary, it's terrifying, you know? Right. So, so it just comes honing in. And uh, anyway, but the book is really great. I've never read the book, but it is one of my favorite scary movies. So yeah, yeah, perhaps so, I should. That's good. Okay. Great. Oh, that seems like a good place to end. Um, thank yeah. you so much. This has been really, really wonderful. Thank you, Ariana. This is great. Thanks. Thank you. We'll hand it back and to Elaine. On behalf of uh, Tattered Cover Bookstore and Porter Square Bookstore and Book Passage, I, I can't thank you enough, Ariana and Eric. This was the most wonderful hour. And it wasn't scary, but boy, am I looking forward to finishing this amazing book, whoops, upside down. Uh, you can get No One Goes Alone in a CD at any of our stores, Tattered Cover, Porter Square, Book Passage, or if you go to any of our websites, you can click on the audio and you'll get to Libro and you can order it from Libro FM. And then the bookstore whose website you came from will get some money for that. So we like that. Uh, and we especially like Eric because he's so gracious. Uh, and I, you can talk about the scariest things with such grace. And I can't think of a better pairing than Ariana and Eric today. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. Remember that uh, one person from each of our three stores will be in a inner dinner drawing. And you will, uh, somebody will receive a three month free subscription to Libro FM. And then after that, I have to warn you, you'll be hooked. Uh, you can see this event again on YouTube. Uh, we uh, know that a lot of people who hear about it from you will want to see it. So please send them to YouTube. Our, our YouTube channel is Book Passage TV. And I'm sure the other stores have a channel which will have it as well. This was a great evening to introduce us to a brand new way of loving Eric Larson. <laughs> Thank you all Thank you. so much. And Thank you. we'll look forward to what you do next. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.